with you, all things are possible. God, I pray that we could go out into the world and be a light and bring people that are blind to see. God, I pray now for our time of um, just studying your word, that you would just settle our hearts and minds, allow us to really take off our blinders and to see you, God, be in your presence and just live in this moment. We love you and we thank you for all things. Amen. Amen. sit down today. That's a little bit more like a coffee house if you're sitting in. (laughs) Well, we're fast approaching um, Palm Sunday, which is next Sunday. And then what's after that? Yeah, Easter, the big day. Um, And so I, I got to thinking, you know, we often focus uh, in, in church life on um, you know, Palm Sunday and Easter, but there was a whole lot went on before that. And so I kind of wanted to look at what was going on in the life of Jesus leading up to Palm Sunday, um, since we're fast approaching it. And uh, so the passage that we're going to look at this morning was shortly before uh, the first Palm Sunday. Um, and so turn over to Luke chapter 18, guys. And I want to look at verses 35 to to 43. And um, this is a passage that I think dramatically illustrates um, what you can glean from God's word when you are willing to um, study the Bible, meditate on it, and really engage in it. And when we are content as believers to simply read our little two-line daily devotional on our phones or wherever we may get it and leave it at that, you miss so much of what God's Word has to teach us. We've got to become students of the Bible if we really want to know um, the God that we serve. So I, just this, this passage is just rich with with uh, awesome truth. So let's take a look at it. Luke 18, beginning with verse 35. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he was, or he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. There's so much good stuff in this passage. Um, I I wasn't quite sure how to put it together in a nice, neat, little flowing sermon format. But that's not what we're about anyhow, is it? And so what I thought that I would do is break it down into sort of three sections. And those three sections are this, guys. I want to take a look at Jesus at this particular moment uh, in his life, the blind man that Jesus healed, and the crowd. All right, and see what we can, can learn from each of those groups. Now, this was shortly before um, Palm Sunday, which was only a a week before, less than a week before the crucifixion. And so here Jesus was very close to facing the cross, his own death, his own betrayal, his own arrest. Um, And yet he took time away to heal a blind man. So 
Let's take a look at Jesus first. What does this passage, this, this event out of the life of Jesus, <clears throat> what does this tell you about Jesus? When you read this, what's this tell you about Jesus? A anything? Jim and then Sue, or Sue then Jim. We'll go ladies first. Yeah, isn't that incredible? He, he was thinking about other people um, rather than himself. We, we saw, and I mean, I didn't pay Sue to do this. That's the first one I had down, too. All right, was, was Jesus was selfless. You know, we as human beings get so, and guys, I'm guilty, too. I'm a human being. I'm right there with you. We get so consumed by our own lives and all the junk we've got going on in our own lives and all the busyness and all the responsibilities that we miss opportunities to share the love of Christ with people because we're so focused on self. And here Jesus was facing a horrific death on the cross, not only a physical death, but a separation from his father because the sin of the world was going to be heaped upon him, and yet he still was able to say, okay, here I am, I'm heading toward Jerusalem and my ultimate destiny, but you know what? I can take a couple of minutes for somebody else. Jim, what'd you see? I was it's pretty much similar. Uh, compassionate for the human race. You know, it wasn't, you know, it was everybody, but just one human being that needed him at that point in time. He was willing to stop yeah. and go and mentor with him. Yeah, and, and Matthew, when you read Matthew's account, he says Jesus had compassion. And I'm going to share with you a little bit more about that in, in a moment. But that's the way uh, Matthew described Jesus' attitude toward the blind man is that he had compassion on him. So you're absolutely right, Jim. Anything else jump out at you about Jesus? Share. Ah, good, yeah. Yeah. Good. So he was. You, you, so you're kind of feel like Jesus was encouraging him to to draw close to him in a, in a relational way because Jesus could have just walked by and went boom and kept going and healed him, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yep. We're going to we're going to talk a little bit about that too. The importance of faith in this whole thing, Vic. Not only did Jesus heal him physically, sight wise, but he saw his heart, the faith that he had. So he opened his heart also. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he he also saw the faithfulness that he had in Jesus, which was a prime example for everybody else. Yeah. The blind man wasn't as blind as what maybe people thought, huh? Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? What did you see in Jesus in this passage? Well, let's take a look at a few of these things and, and a few more, a little bit more in depth. One, uh, Sue mentioned selflessness, and, and we talked about that a little bit. And, and also along with that, some of these things that you guys have been mentioning is that uh, Jesus had time for people, and, and he was never too busy. You know, he was never too busy for people. Have you ever heard somebody say, or maybe you've even said it before, and when I hear people say this, I just kind of cringe. But people say, well, I, you, they're, they're maybe going through something. You ask them, well, have you been praying about it? Oh, oh no, God doesn't have, have time for my little problems. Have you ever felt that way? That is just an absolute lie from the devil. All right, and this is a perfect example. Here Jesus was with all the stuff on his mind, crowds following him, people probably wanting something from him all the time, and yet he was never too busy for the regular average guy or girl that he encountered that had a need. He was never too busy for them. And the reason is, and it's something that uh, Jim alluded to, is uh, because of Jesus' compassion. I mean, God is a God of compassion, and we need to really remember that. And uh, something that I think highlights that for us is that uh, not only did Matthew say that Jesus had compassion on him, 
But when you read Matthew's account, we find out that Jesus actually encountered two blind men at that moment. It, one, one of the gospel accounts gives us the name of one, and his name was Bartimaeus. And it doesn't give us the name of the other one, but two guys were sitting there, blind, begging, and when Jesus walk, walked by, they cried out to him. And so what that tells us is, look, guys, um, um, Jesus isn't concerned about just certain people at certain given times. He cares about everybody all the time. You know, I mean, he could have just healed one guy, but he didn't. He healed both. You know, and it wasn't just this particular instance where Jesus healed people that in need, were in need, but anybody that came to him, as Sherry said, in faith, Jesus had compassion on and... Um, he healed them. So I want you to remember this, and this is something, guys, I need to remember too, is that God is compassionate toward everyone. And so I want you to realize that when you're in need, God is compassionate toward your need, compassionate to what you're struggling with. He cares about you. He has time for you. He doesn't pour out his mercy and his power and his compassion just upon certain select individuals. It is available to everybody. And he showed that when he healed both of these guys that were um, in need that day. The other thing that jumps out at me about this passage involving Jesus and... Um, I forget who brought it up. Somebody might have been in the conversation. But he's a rewarder of faith. He's a rewarder of faith. Look at verse 42. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. And what is it that healed him? Your faith has healed you. We've got to understand the power of faith in our lives. And we've got to, as believers, we've got to start operating in the realm of faith rather than in the realm of doubt. And yet I know from my own life, and I know engaging in the, with the lives of other believers, that most believers operate in the realm of doubt rather than in the realm of faith. So that when we come to Jesus... The first thing that enters our minds is, I wonder if God is really going to answer what I'm asking of him. That's doubt. It's always, hmm, I wonder if. And yet it is faith that heals. Faith that moves the hand of God. Faith that brings about miracles. And we see it all through the scriptures. This isn't the only time that Jesus said, according to your faith, it will be done to you. And so you could reverse that and say, according to your doubt, it will be done to you. So in other words, if you doubt, you're not going to get anything. But if you have faith, you will. And so if we're going to reach this world, guys, that is plummeting out of control and that wants to have nothing to do with God, we have, and I'm speaking to myself here because I, I, I wrestle with it too, is we have got to start being believers who operate in faith, not in doubt. Eric? Doesn't this passage also speak to the power of Jesus uh, due to the fact that these blind men could not see him? And if you close your eyes and you have, say, several hundred people walk by you, wow. How do you? Yeah, yeah, kind of like the woman with the issue of blood, you know, just power had to just exude from Jesus, you know, um, and yeah, you're right, I mean, Jesus knowing who was in need, having the power to meet that need, no matter what it was, I mean, whether, guys, whether it was delivering somebody from demon possession, whether it was healing someone whose hand was shriveled, whether it was healing somebody who was physically blind, somebody who couldn't walk, whether it was people who were hungry, whatever the need was, Jesus had the power to meet that need. He had the compassion to the place where he was willing to meet that need. 
and he was never a respecter of persons. He never said, well, I'm going to do this for you, but not for you. If they had a need and they came to him in faith, he met that need. And he hasn't changed from this episode right before the first Palm Sunday to today, where we're facing Palm Sunday next week. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Um, I, I, I see this incredible contrast in this passage, and, and I'll share with you more of where I'm coming from as we go. But this incredible contrast between the blind man and the crowd. The blind man, or men, because it was actually two there, but the blind man, um, though he was physically blind, he could really see, as Vic pointed out. He had the eyes of faith, which are far more important than physical eyes. And the way that I know that that guy had faith was not just because Jesus healed him. That was one evidence, because Jesus wouldn't have healed him if he hadn't had faith. He said, your faith has healed you. But here's how I know that he had faith. He understood who Jesus was. He saw through eyes of faith to know who Jesus was. And here's how I know that he knew who Jesus was. And I want you to think about this for a minute, um, considering um, the, all of the disadvantages that these two guys had. Being in the first century, being physically blind, basically any type of modern medicine didn't exist at the time, or very little. Um, people that had physical disabilities um, were sentenced to sitting by the city gates or alongside the roads begging for help. That's the only way that they could live because they didn't have social security disability. They didn't have entitlement programs. They didn't have all of the community programs. There wasn't a church on every corner offering a free meal. They had to depend upon the goodness of the people uh, that would walk by them and hear them crying out, you know, alms for the poor. But here was a guy that despite all of those disadvantages and every reason to be bitter, to uh, be angry at God, to be negative, to have no faith, but be operating in doubt, instead he did, said something very telling. He said this, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And you notice what the crowd said. It's Jesus of Nazareth who is passing by. Jesus, son of David, was a messianic terminology. That was a term that was used to designate the Messiah. This blind man, despite all of the disadvantages in his life, including probably not having any type of education, because people didn't have educations back then, probably didn't get to go to the synagogue much to hear the rabbis teach because someone would have had to take them physically there because you notice here Jesus said bring him to me so the crowds had to bring him actually over to Jesus so I guarantee you that these two blind guys rarely ever made it to the synagogue to hear teaching but yet they knew Jesus was the Messiah they didn't say hey, teacher, they didn't say, hey, rabbi, they didn't even say like the crowds, hey, Jesus of Nazareth, they said, Jesus, son of David, which means Messiah, have mercy on us. That's faith. That's having spiritually open eyes, not being blind. They were blind physically, but they were not blind spiritually. So besides their eyes being open to the realm of faith, what do you guys see um, about the blind man? Tell me what you see in him, or they, because there's really two of them, but uh, Luke focuses on one. So we'll just say him for now. But uh, what do you guys see in the blind man, besides being a man of faith and a man that could see though he was physically blind? Yeah, absolutely. 
Yes. He was not easily discouraged, was he? Yeah. Yeah, the crowd was like, leave Jesus alone. Leave the teacher alone. Kind of like Jesus is up here and you lowly person down there. Don't be bothering the master. And yet he kept crying out, didn't he? Jesus, son of David, have mercy. Well, he got louder. Yeah, yeah, that's what I like. He was more determined. Yeah, became more determined. I like that. The crowds were trying to shut him up, and he's like, oh, no, I'm getting to my Jesus. Yeah, very good. I like it. What else do you see there? Well, let me just say this, guys. Always be persistent in your faith. Always be persistent in prayer. Don't let anyone ever discourage you. Matter of fact, Jesus even said that we should always pray and never give up. Don't let anyone or anything discourage you. You be persistent, just like the blind man. I don't care what somebody tells you. If they say, oh, you shouldn't be praying about that. Oh, you haven't gotten it yet. You might as well give up. Sometimes the devil whispers that in our ear. Our own doubtful flesh tells us that. You just look and just, you just keep crying out to Jesus louder and louder. It may not happen right away. It might take a long time. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. But if we stay with it, isn't that an evidence of faith? If we give up, it's an evidence of what? Doubt. Doubt. Yeah. What else do you see in this? So we've got a man of faith, a man who could see spiritually, though he was physically blind, someone who was persistent and not easily discouraged. See anything else? Teresa kind of alluded to it in her statement a little bit. That he didn't follow the crowd, but he followed Jesus. After he was healed, he followed Jesus. But he wasn't following the crowd. The crowd was telling him to shut up. Mm -hmm. But he wouldn't let the crowd sway him. He, he was going to get to Jesus, and then he was going to follow Jesus. We need, as Christians, we need to be more like the blind man who don't succumb to peer pressure. When all the dissenting voices around us say, I don't want anything to do with church. I don't want anything to do with God. We need to keep going. Keep speaking up. Keep living for Jesus. Sherry? Well, there at the very end, the crowd ends up praising God and following him. Yeah. Yeah. So because of his persistence, the crowd got to see who Jesus really was, that he was son of David. He was Messiah not just Jesus of, of the town, the area, Nazareth. Yeah, very good. What about the crowd? What do you guys see in the crowd? Anything jump out at you about the crowd? If, any, if anything, they were following more along the line of peer pressure. Because, oh, well, somebody else is doing it. I've got to follow along, too. Yeah. If he was the, like you said, the Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, well, that's uh, today's... Uh, Society's idol of the, of the week. Oh, I gotta follow this person because they're walking down the street. That was how he gathered a group together because they saw somebody else doing it. Not yeah. because they knew much about what they were following, just that they followed what everybody else was doing. And that is so true of today, guys. Society operates off of a mob mentality. What everybody else is doing, I'm gonna do. Not taking any time to think it through to use their brain say, to decide whether this is right or wrong or something I should be involved in. Just my buddies are doing it. Everybody on TV's doing it. The talk show hosts say I should do it, so I'm going to jump right on in. Absolutely. And you know the way that I know they were operating out of a mob mentality? Is because even though they were following Jesus, they weren't really following Jesus. They were physically following him, but they weren't following him with their hearts. And you know how I know that? A couple of reasons. Some of them we had mentioned. One is because they referred to him as Jesus of Nazareth. So they didn't really know he was Messiah. If so, they'd have been like the blind man who said Jesus, son of David. They would have understood who he was. Uh, eyes of faith knew that. They didn't have the eyes of faith. They also wouldn't have sat, if they really had faith in who they were following, they wouldn't have silenced the beggars. They would have brought the beggars to and say, yes, we agree. He's 
faithful enough to kill you. He yes. wouldn't have been trying to silence you. Yeah. It's like, how, how could you... Um, Eric brought out that power that would have been around Jesus, that if you got near Jesus, you'd have been sort of like in this realm of, of the Son of God. You know, it's like, how can you be in the presence of the Almighty and it not just like affect you in some way? And yet here they were following Jesus, supposedly, and somebody who was in need, they were telling them to shut up. Don't bother Jesus. How do you follow Jesus with your heart and think that about another person? Treat another person that way. You know, so, I, so they were following him physically, but I don't think they were following Jesus physically. Matter of fact, let me turn back over here real quick to, uh, and see which one it was. It was Matthew or Mark's um, account. But, uh, oh yeah, it was in Mark's account. And uh, starting with verse 48 of chapter 10, it says, Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man, and listen to this, Cheer up on your feet, he's calling you. I might be wrong because I wasn't there, but that sounds condescending to me. You know, they're like, okay, Cheer up. You, you, he went ahead and decided to, to take time for you. How do you have that attitude toward a person that was in that state in their life and truly have been following Jesus? Truly have been open to what Jesus was all about? Joanne? How is it that the crowd was that selfish? Yeah. Because they wanted to keep the Jesus idea to themselves and didn't want a faithful person to walk forward. Mm, I like that. Yeah. Do you guys ever see that at all within Christians these days? Oh, I'm happy in my nice, safe little church building where we sing about Jesus and talk about him on Sunday morning. But when I encounter the, uh, the unlovely of society, the people that maybe look different than me, smell different than me, uh, dress different than me, don't want to have anything to do with them. I just want to keep my Jesus to myself. That's disgusting. Sorry. Just is. Remember the video Rachel showed about the Great Commission? Jesus was for everybody, and he told us to go reach everybody. Um, here's another way I know that... Um, they followed Jesus physically, but they weren't following him from the heart, from the eyes of faith, is that many of these same people followed Jesus into Jerusalem, and on Palm Sunday, they cried out, blessed be him who comes in the name of the Lord. But then five days later, what did they cry out? Crucify him. Mob mentality again. I mean, if you're really following Jesus, how within the period of like two weeks do you turn around and the one you were following, you start yelling, crucify him? That's not following Jesus. And here's another way I know that they weren't really following him. Is, and I don't know this for sure. I don't know this for sure. But previous to this event in Jesus' life, Jesus fed the 5,000. Okay? They, they were in need. They were hungry. They had been listening to his teaching. It was late in the day. Jesus, again, had compassion on them. He miraculously fed 5,000, and that would have been probably just the men, not women and children, so it would have been more than that. They continued to follow him All right, afterwards. And you know what Jesus said to them? Well, what Jesus did is he went across the lake, and the, and the people had to make it over to where he was. And when they finally got there, they said, Jesus, we, we've been looking for you. And here's what, how Jesus responded to him. He said, you haven't been looking for me because you saw miraculous signs. In other words, not because you saw signs that revealed to you that I'm Jesus, son of David, the Messiah. But here's what he said to him. 
You've been looking for me because you got your bellies full. That's why they were looking for Jesus. It's not because they were following him as the Messiah, but because they wanted one more thing out of Jesus. He filled their bellies when he, when he fed them, and now they're looking for him again for something else. Joanna and Jim. Looking for the next handout. Yep. Isn't that amazing how in a span of two weeks, you know the word got around that two men were healed and could see again sitting outside the gate for all that time, you know it spread because it was a small town. How you can in two weeks know that a, a, a miracle like that and this individual actually did it. Jesus, whether you want to call him of Nazareth or the son of David, and then to turn around and want to crucify somebody that did a miracle like that just two weeks earlier. Yeah. And it says that the guys followed Jesus, so they were there with them. So the very guys that were miraculously healed were in the crowd, probably on. Uh, they physically saw them. They, they had to. They had to physically yeah. see it because they were standing and they were seeing. It. And they were part of that crowd, still seeing those guys, and they were still yelling out, "Crucify him!" Sue, and I go back to to Connor, then back up Joanne. Yeah, absolutely. That, she, you talk about the Sadducees. You're talking yeah. about the. I'm just saying that anybody they didn't want to back up Jesus because they didn't want to be preservation. Yeah, and even the disciples ended up giving into that. Yeah. You know, I mean, they they all abandoned Jesus when once he was arrested. Yeah. So yeah, it's just it, it's it, guys, it's it's. When we look at it that way, it's mind-boggling, but what we also have to do is be honest with ourselves and see if we sometimes on some level don't do the same thing. When we cower down to the crowd or to our peers or to our family or to the people that are like, I don't want to have anything to do with church or Jesus. And we kind of tuck our tails and run, stay silent, self-preservation. Who would I have next? Uh, back here to Connor. Repeat that once more. No, absolutely. I mean, they live by it these days. Yeah, absolutely. So, so oh, Joanna, you next. Go ahead. Those individuals may have even stayed silent, but their silence spoke louder by not being present and standing up for them. No, there you go. So That's even good. if they didn't join in the words the crowd was saying, they weren't trying to Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's good. Because, yeah, I, I think that's probably, I, I think, a fair statement that we can say that, um, you know, after Jesus had been arrested, that not everybody in the crowd yelled out, crucify him. There were probably some that were like, I can't believe this is happening. Why are people doing it? But they didn't say anything in defense of him. And our, and our silence speaks louder. Yeah, silence speaks louder. Absolutely. So, yeah, guys, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to participate in a sinful act to be complicit. If you um, stay silent and don't stand up for your Lord, you're still wrong. Yeah. So let me, here's how I would kind of uh, sum up a couple of these things. One is, guys, we don't follow Jesus because of what we can get out of him. We follow him because of who he is. And yet the crowd was following him for what they could get out of him, not because of who he was. And then I would say this, that um, the crowd was blind even though they could see. And what a contrast. I alluded to that a little bit earlier. Here were two guys that were physically blind, but they could really see because they knew who Jesus was. Then you had a whole crowd that was physically able to see but they were blind to who Jesus was. I'm going to close with this, and Rachel's going to come up and, and lead us. Um, and this is that really famous guy um, that always has such incredible insights, and you've heard me talk about him before. His name's Anonymous. Um, but uh, Anonymous had this incredible quote that I think uh, kind of sums up what we've been talking about. 
And it says this, the eyes are useless when the mind is blind. Mm -hmm. The eyes are useless when the mind is blind. Um, open your mind to Jesus and you'll really see. You don't have to have physical eyes to see Jesus. When you open your heart and open your mind to Jesus, that's when you really see. And for you at home, too. That's, that's seeing, is when you see Jesus through the eyes of faith. Let me pray as Rachel comes up. Jesus, thank you for being who you are, for being compassionate, for not being a respecter of persons, that you love all of us, you desire to, to, to bless all of us, to, to pour out your mercy and compassion upon all of us. Lord, thank you for the example of those two blind men. And Lord, let us be like them. People that see through the eyes of faith. People that don't bow to peer pressure. People who are persistent and say, I'm going to get to Jesus. I want to be next to my Lord. I want to touch my Lord. I need... I need God to intervene, and I'm going to stay with it. And my faith will bring the answer. Lord, let us be so, not just here in this room in the confines of the safety of a fellowship of believers, but let us be the same out there in the world where sometimes, Lord, we stand alone and yet you are with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as the worship team comes, um, would you stand with me as we sing our last song?